Hi, welcome back to another video. Have you ever been told that sugar is bad and that you should stop eating it? But why is it bad? How does sugar actually harm our bodies? Well, watch till the end of this video and we're going to answer these questions as well as talk about how our body processes sugar and what sugar actually is and even talk about how exercise can change how we utilize and process sugar. But before we go further, could I ask you for a small favor by hitting the like button, subscribe and sharing your thoughts or feedback in the comments below, as this would help me to reach a wider audience. Thank you. Well, so first, what is sugar? Most of us are referring to table sugar, which is often associated with some negative connotations, like sugar is bad for you. It causes weight gain. It is associated with diabetes. It can cause inflammation and the list go on and on. But are these accurate or even fair assessments of sugar? And could there ever be potential situations where sugar might be beneficial? Well, for a start, sugar is a type of carbohydrates. And interestingly, it is the same carbohydrates that are found in fruits, vegetables and other whole food sources that we typically consider as good for us. Let's start with the term carbohydrate. They are compounds that are made of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, and they include things like sugars, starches and even cellulose. Now, we don't often talk about cellulose because this is something our body cannot break down and absorb. And it is one of those contributors to the fibers in your diet. So it helps us to push things along in your large intestines, assisting with bowel movements. But we can definitely break down and absorb sugars and starches into our bloodstream through the small intestine. And we typically use this as energy sources. And again, both sugars and starches fall under this umbrella of carbohydrates. But what are the differences? Well, it is the size of the molecules. For simple sugars, these are smaller carbohydrate molecules such as disaccharides and monosaccharides. And saccharides basically just means sugar. Di means two, mono means one. And so a disaccharide is made up of two monosaccharides. For example, lactose is a disaccharide found in milk products. And of course, sucrose is a disaccharide that makes up table sugar. And sucrose is made up of one monosaccharide called glucose bonded to another monosaccharide called fructose. So glucose plus fructose equals sucrose, which is table sugar. You may now be thinking to yourself, what is it about table sugar? And therefore the fructose and glucose make it worse than the fructose and glucose that is found in fruits and vegetables and other food sources. Well, to answer that, I think we need to talk a little bit about the starches. Starches are complex carbohydrates, which are polysaccharides. And the starches that humans ingest most are amylose and amylose pectin. And these are multiple glucose molecules strung together. You could think of them as long chains of glucose. Hence, they're referred to as polysaccharides. Now we can definitely compare and contrast these to the disaccharides or table sugar. As we can see, yes, they both do contain glucose, but there is a huge difference in the size of, say, the molecules of table sugar versus the size of the molecules that make up starches. And the negative potential effect of the table sugar has to do with how it is broken down and absorbed into the body. So once we place the sugar and starches into our mouths, this is where the process of digestion begins, through chewing and through the secretion of saliva, which contains certain enzymes to help start this digestive process. We then move this down to the esophagus and then into the stomach, where the sugars and starches will mix with the acid through the smooth muscle contractions of the stomach. And this mixture will eventually make it to the first part of the small intestine, called the duodenum. Now, the duodenum contains specific enzymes that can break down specific types of carbohydrates. For example, sucrase will break down sucrose into individual glucose and fructose molecules that we talked about earlier. Amylase is a specific enzyme to break down amylose. And what is important to understand is that our bodies can only absorb the monosaccharides, meaning the individual glucose and fructose molecules. So you can see that this breakdown and digestive process is important for the absorption. And as the glucose and fructose molecules move further down the small intestine, as they have been freed through the digestive process, they will move into the duodenum and ileum, the second and the third part of the small intestine, and then be absorbed through the wall and into the bloodstream. And once those glucose and fructose molecules are in the bloodstream, the first place they will go is the liver, 
where it will convert those fructose molecules into glucose molecules. So we don't have those fructose molecules circulating around the body. So when we measure, say, like blood sugar levels, we're measuring blood glucose levels, as glucose is the primary monosaccharide that is circulating throughout our body. Let's now talk about the breakdown and absorption rate of, say, like sugar versus the breakdown and absorption rate of starch. And remember, we mentioned that sugars are relatively small carbohydrate molecules. They disaccharides, especially when we compare them to the complex carbohydrate polysaccharides. And because of these differences, the sugar, the disaccharides, tend to be broken down and absorbed much more quickly. So the blood sugar levels will rise more rapidly. But they will also taper off or go down more rapidly as compared to, say, like a complex carbohydrate where that breakdown or that digestion is more slow and so the blood sugar levels tend to rise more slowly but they also tend to be sustained for a longer period of time and one of the negative things about sugar is that the blood sugar levels could spike but then also kind of crash down now you can combat that in some situations if you just eat sugars you will be dealing with that spike and crash but if you pair that simple sugar say with complex sugar or complex carbohydrate Yes, the blood sugar levels would increase relatively rapidly, but then you get that sustained blood sugar level because you have that complex carbohydrate falling behind. Now, there are certain situations where I want a simple sugar to raise the blood sugar levels quickly. Say if you're hypoglycemic, I don't want to wait for complex carbohydrate. I want to get a simple sugar in there to raise the blood sugar levels up to get them out of that hypoglycemic state. Or maybe I'm a marathon runner and halfway through the marathon, my glucose level are getting low and I need to get an energy boost of glucose into my bloodstream as quickly as possible. But the ideal situation is to have a balanced intake of carbohydrates or blood sugar levels. And one thing I do want to mention is that in a clinical setting, if you have to get somebody blood sugar levels up or during a marathon, it is not like giving people like a spoonful of table sugar. There are certain mixtures or products that are made up of simple sugars or simple carbohydrate to get this done. And we have to go back to this idea that I mentioned earlier. The glucose molecule in table sugar is the exact same structure as the glucose molecule from food, vegetable or other whole food sources. It is not like the glucose molecule from the sugar is labeled as poison by our bodies, but the glucose molecules from the whole grain food is good. No, your body doesn't actually care of the differences between where the glucose comes from. Glucose is glucose. Now, although our body doesn't differentiate between the sources from where the glucose comes from, there are still some important considerations we have to have when it comes to sugar. For example, sugar is often referred to as empty calories, meaning that the glucose and fructose is essentially all we get in the form of calories and energy from that sugar as opposed to getting that glucose and fructose from whole food sources, which are often associated with other benefits like vitamins, fibers and other nutrients that can improve our health and wellness. Now, when I have to pick the most negative thing when it comes to sugar, it's probably empty calories. We can eat a tons of it without actually feeling that full. And when you think about it from the perspective of, say, like early human ancestors, did they get carbohydrates and some simple sugars through fruits and vegetables? Yes, of course. But were they also adding refined table sugars to the food they were already eating? No, but we do. Say if you drink soft drinks or soda with your meal, you're adding that sugar to foods that we already eat. Again, probably doesn't increase how full we feel, but that increased the amount of carbohydrates and sugars, and therefore calories that we ingest on a day-to-day -day basis. So the sugar in and of itself is not evil. It is the amount that we are getting easily included in our daily diet. Now, another thing that we need to consider is what happens if there's an excess amount of glucose circulating throughout the body? Now, we already know that the glucose will first go to the liver and any fructose that is in there will just get converted to glucose anyway. But the liver will also start to store the glucose in its storage form, which is called glycogen and the liver can store about 100 grams of glycogen and the rest of the glucose that isn't stored in the liver will circulate out of the body. And yes, insulin is going to be released by the pancreas in response to these increasing blood sugar levels. So essentially, insulin tells the majority of the cells in your body to take the glucose from the bloodstream and into themselves, therefore lowering blood glucose or blood sugar level. 
And if we take a look at the skeletal muscle in particular, that glucose that gets pulled into skeletal muscle tissue will also get stored as glycogen. And the skeletal muscle throughout your body could store about 400 to 500 grams of glycogen depending on who you are. So both the liver and the skeletal muscle tissues are little storage tanks for glycogen and glucose. But what happens when we have completely filled up the liver and skeletal muscle tissues and there's still more glucose in the bloodstream? Well, that is when we start to see glucose getting converted into fats and getting stored in the adipose tissue. And that is where we can start to run into problems by really increasing our glucose or our sugar intake beyond the capacity of our liver and our skeletal muscle tissues. So consistently ingesting too much of it and having increased blood glucose levels, the excess blood glucose will be stored as fat, increasing your weight over time. And an increase in edibles tissues can be associated with conditions such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Finally, how does exercise influence or even change how we process sugar or glucose? Moderate to intense activity causes the skeletal muscles to preferentially shift the source of energy to burning more carbohydrates than fats. Also, as someone increases the activity or consistently exercises, the ability to store glycogen in the skeletal muscle increases. So think of your skeletal muscle as gas tank for glycogen. So when they get bigger, you can store more glycogen. And if you compare that to an inactive person, the resting glycogen stores are about 20 to 30% less than that of an active person. So in theory, someone who is consistently active could eat more carbohydrates, not only because they are just burning more calories on a day-to-day -day basis, but also because they have the ability to store more of it in their skeletal muscles before it will start getting converted to fat. Well, exercise also sensitizes muscle to insulin, especially directly after exercise. And this is the opposite of what happens during type 2 diabetes, where the majority of cells throughout the body becomes insensitive to insulin. But exercise has this sensitizing effect, especially with skeletal muscles. Interestingly, an exercising muscle doesn't actually need insulin to bring in the glucose like a resting muscle does. So say if you're running a marathon or exercising and you ingest like a simple sugar to replenish your carbohydrate stores, those contracting muscles can bring in the glucose without the need for insulin. So you can see there are some amazing benefits to exercise through how it helps us to process and utilize those sugars or that glucose. It would obviously be great if we can get our carbohydrate only from the whole food sources. But in real life, as long as the majority of your carbohydrates come from whole food sources and you have this balanced ratio of carbohydrates to lipids to proteins, you are likely going to be just fine with indulging into your favorite sugary treat every so often. And remember, one of the best times to consume carbohydrate is directly after exercises, when those skeletal muscles are sensitized to bring in that glucose to replenish the glycogen stores. And for your information, it is also a good time to add protein to that because your skeletal muscles are primed to also bring in those amino acids or those proteins to help the rebuilding process. And as always, thank you for watching and until next week, take care. Thank you for watching until the end. If you like this video, please click the like button. Please leave your comments below and share this video. Hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of my future weekly video release. Please also subscribe to this channel. This is free of charge, but will help the channel to grow. If you're interested in improving your health and fitness or losing weight, if you suffer from or wish to prevent back pain, please take a look at my book, which is now available from Amazon Worldwide. Thank you.